Security Weekly is brought to you by NetSpark are the developers of desktop and cloud-based web application security scanners that enable you to automatically identify vulnerabilities in your web applications and web services. NetSparker scanners employ a unique and dead accurate vulnerability scanning engine that automatically verifies vulnerabilities with a proof of concept. For more information, visit them on the web at netsparker.com or email them at contact at netsparker.com. ProXPN is the leading VPN service offering free accounts, excellent premium features, and an outstanding commitment to privacy and security online. Use the discount code WEEKLY and save 50% off for life. Tenable Network Security, creators of Nessus, the world's best vulnerability scanner. Jumpstart your security program today and evaluate Security Center CV, the continuous monitoring solution. For more information, visit them on the web at tenable.com. Overwhelmed when it comes time to choose which cigar to smoke? Confused by the differences between 60 Ring Gauge, Robusto, Corona, and Lancero? Do you yearn to try all the new cigars on the market? but need a guide to tell you where to start? Look no further than the Stogie Geek Show! Hosted by yours truly and Will Cooper, we've made it our mission to educate both new and experienced cigar smokers. Tune in for interviews with leaders in the cigar industry, how-to segments, and weekly cigar reviews. Visit stogiegeeks.com to subscribe to our podcast, watch the live show, and discover our video archives. Stogie Geeks, geeks kicking ass. Welcome back, everyone, to Security Weekly. This is the security news for this week. I got Mr. Joff Thire and Jack Daniel on the lines via Skype, and we're going to talk about some stories. Where do you want to start, Mr. Joff and Jack? Oh, just so difficult. Well, so broken. I, I, there's some, what, dude, broken. There's some one of the, really one of the golden ones. nuggets in there. This, Go ahead, Joff. Uh, there's lots of nuggets, but one of the big ones was Verizon Enterprise customer data breach. Oh, I didn't see that one. Uh, yeah, I don't know if you caught yeah. this. But, so, did uh, they have to report it? Like Verizon data breach report? Does this give new meaning to the Verizon data breach report? I think it's... Like um, an internal Verizon data breach report? It's, it seems kind of incestuous, doesn't it? When they, um, when they report this breach to their customers, do they call it the Verizon data breach report? <laughs> yeah. So Krebs ran this story, uh, and, he, and he states, earlier this week, a prominent member of closely guarded underground cybercrime forum posted a new thread advertising the sale of a database containing contact information for some 1.5 million customers million. of Verizon. Like million million. Of Verizon Enterprise. So I'm pretty sure there's a lot of... Um, uh, throat choking and hand wringing going on at Verizon right now, but and, and I feel for him. But um, yeah, so uh, the seller apparently priced the entire package at a hundred thousand dollars, but also offered to sell off pieces of it, a uh, hundred thousand records um, per chunk, at ten thousand dollars a chunk. What a bargain! Uh, yeah, bargain, right? Yeah, it's a bargain. So bargain. Uh, yeah, park the car in Harvard Yard. Anyway. Um, yeah, so, um, apparently buyers were also offered an option to purchase information about security vulnerabilities in Verizon's website as well. Just a little extra, uh, cream on the cake or something. No, icing on the cake. That's the words I was looking cream for. Cream on the cake would be weird, Joff. Just. Yeah, that would be throw that out weird. There. Way weird. <laughs> Wait, I saw that movie. Take your, ha- take your half and half and just dump it right on the cake. It's awesome. I yeah, promise. Try it at the next the birthday cake. party. It'd be great. So anyway, Verizon <laughs> apparently is in the process of alerting their affected customers, and as they should, uh, and uh, they're working on it. But uh, I can't believe we didn't get Carlos on the show. Yeah, that's a shame. Um, Carlos is on. <laughs> Carlos Perez is on the FBI's Cyber's Most Wanted list. Did you Are guys you know? kidding me? There's no. Did you guys know? It says. It's the FBI's, and there's a link in there to FBI.gov forward slash wanted forward slash cyber. Go there now to check it out. And the title reads, Wanted by the FBI, Cybers Most Wanted. And then you can select the images of suspects to display more information. The like sixth or seventh one on the list is, in fact, Carlos Enrique Perez. 
Melara. That's right. Is it the same Carlos Perez? That's my it question. Is the, is, it kind of, it, it's sort of. It, it is not. <clears throat> it is not, not the, it's same, not the one same one. And no. our poor Carlos. I mean, that's a, that's a very common name. It, yeah, it, I was about to say, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that is an extremely common name. And um, Carlos always yeah. says he gets stopped when he goes through any kind of well, security checkpoint. And I didn't my, believe yeah, him. My now favorite I do. one of those stories was there was a guy named Edward Kennedy on the do not fly list, which our late senator here in Massachusetts um, had an episode over the accuracy of the do not fly list when they tried to keep the senior senator from Massachusetts from flying once. That ended up really poorly for people at TSA. But, um, you know, if, <laughs> you, if you happen to be our friend, Carlos, uh, you're not a senior senator from uh, Massachusetts. Right. And, you can't do anything when somebody with a common name uh, ends up on a list that you don't want to be associated with. Yep. Yeah, right. I mean, my understanding is <laughs> from my friend Mike Perez. <coughs> yeah, Perez is a very Perez common. Is a, a fairly common Hispanic name. So, um, yeah, that's a I, I wish Carlos were on. He told me once how many people with the first name Carlos and last name Perez there were on his street, and it's like many. Just, I mean, on his block, there are a handful, you know, it's, which is something I didn't realize until dealing with more and more B-sides in Latin America, that that's why uh, it's frequent in Latin American communities to go by first name, what we would call middle name, because that uh, is more descriptive or more unique. Um, right. Well, I probably got that wrong and somebody will correct me, but that is, that's the way it's been explained to me. That's why you frequently uh, have folks that... Uh, where middle names become more prominent than family names because of uh, commonality. The one savings grace that uh, in this particular incident is that it is a hyphenated last name. So uh, people are paying attention. They will notice it is Perez Melcar. Right. Well, also it's a hyphenated name. So when they type a hyphen into the input screen in a government website, it probably crashes the SQL database. <laughs> You're right. Instant SQL ejection, right? It's true. <laughs> <laughs> Failure to escape special characters, boom. Oh, that's beautiful. I wish that were entirely a joke. Yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> I wish the story was a joke. I'm going to quote from the article. The article reads, and I quote, The hack, which involved SQL injection and phishing, exposed the water, com water authorities aging AS400-based operational control system because... Stop. Login... Stop. Login credentials, get this, login credentials for the AS400, I almost fell over, were stored on the front end web server. I'm going to repeat that. Because what? login what? credentials for the AS400 were stored on the front end web server. This system, which was connected to the internet, managed oh. programmable PLCs that regulated valves and ducts that controlled the flow of water and chemicals used to treat it through the system. <laughs> wow. Stop. I, I, Stop. How, how, do you, well, how do you follow that up? How do you follow up that much stupidity? In, well, I, 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 I'm, I'm sort of vacillating between the thought. I'm just going to drink. Thought, you talk. I, I'm just going to drink. Okay. I'm vacillating between the thought of job security and <sighs> human annihilation. And I'm not sure... <laughs> I'm not sure which way to go right now. Drinking straight from the bottle is the way to go. Right? Yeah. <laughs> I, well, I ran and out. We, the great thing is we all, um, after all of all these years, we can all still be appalled by this, but we probably shouldn't be. You know, we shouldn't be I surprised. Know. I we know. Should, we should be I appalled. Know. I'm appalled. But it's I am amazing appalled we can still and I'm be appalled. Smart. I'm Paul who is appalled at this yes. story. Jim. I, as, like I said, you should be appalled. But it, it, I don't know that it's surprising, as, yeah, as uh, horrifying as that is. It's like, it, it can't be true. Oh, yeah. Actually, it's, that's not make-believe. It, that's, it, that's, should, it shouldn't surprise us anymore, but yet somehow. It's so horrific. It, <laughs> it still, still does. shocks us. It's just, it's, it's, oh, <sighs> All right, you ready for another one? Everyone take a drink. Got to get ready for this next one. Got to get ready okay. for this next one. It requires drinking. Drinking Heavy hands. drinking. Okay, my story number yeah. 12. Former bug in oh. CCT so CCTV software. CCTV, just stop. Yeah. It's may it's have be just given point-of-sale hackers some foothold. This kills me. Here's the quote. And I quote, 
The big security problem is that this kind of software shouldn't be accessible from the public internet. <laughs> oh, man. I, you know, I, first of all, I'd love to think that, that was possible, but everybody <sighs> listening has has walked into places that had air-gapped computers that had Ethernet cables plugged into well, them. No, no, so, you but know. here's the thing, Jack. Here's the, the thing. And I couldn't think of a better analogy, and I apologize. Right. But that's like I go buy a car, and the manufacturer of that car says, well, you know, the seatbelt kind of kind of sucks. There's some problems with the seatbelt. So just don't drive it over 20 miles an hour, and you'll probably right. be exactly. fine. Right? Right. Yeah, that's like CCDV don't, don't going, hey, you know, our software's right. kind of crappy, so just make sure it's never exposed to the Internet because bad things that's will right, happen. Right, right. It's like, right. who, yeah, who right. buys it's, crap it's, like it's, that? It's, it's, well, it's that world. It's the world of people that haven't been exposed to security. We, we, we see it with, or with common data sense, and industrial control. Apparently. We see it in healthcare. We see it in in automobiles, you know, people that haven't been through the decades of I mean, forget that people that have that should know better still turn out crap code. But this level of crap code is just people that haven't been exposed to it. And when you try to reach out to them, yeah, they think you're extortionists or criminals, and they sue you or threaten to sue you. And it's it's just it's, I'm it's trying to think of some better examples though. Like the most. there's got to be some better examples. Like you buy something that has a flaw in it, and the manufacturer says, well, you know what, just don't use it that way. So so in the case of a vehicle, okay, you know what, just don't drive it on the road, okay? I mean, I don't know if it's a flaw. I mean, it's not, a, but you'd buy a hair dryer and there's a label on it that says, hey, don't put it in the bathtub. Like, duh. You have a C, I mean, but this isn't the same thing. If I have a yeah. CCTV system, I shouldn't, like, not have to connect it to the internet, right? Like, how am I supposed to monitor it if I can't connect it to the right, internet, exactly. right? That's, that's that's what it's designed for, right? right. It's, it's, it's for designed monitoring. for remote yes. access. right. It, it, ah. it would be one thing if it was like, hey, here's software for this, you know, CAD CAM program, or here's software right. for the CNC router. This, uh, you know, it's like, huh, well, really, should I be you know, cutting half million dollar pieces for power plants in my, you know, in my jammies from the house. Nah, I should probably be in the office and monitor that. But right. TV, right? CCTV, the idea is that you're not there, so you have to monitor remotely, and therefore you're going to connect it via Ethernet. And once you connect it via Ethernet, it's on the Internet sooner or later, probably sooner. I, I, just, well, I, think, I, I think the thing that's really surprising to me is... The implicit assumption here that, okay, A, don't connect it to the internet, but B, you're going to connect it to a network. So the implicit assumption is that whatever network you connect it to is not going to be hostile. <laughs> right. What? Yeah. Wait. Well, <laughs> and, 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 like, who, I mean, and this quote comes from the journalist writing the article for Computer World. They said the big security problem is that this kind of software shouldn't be accessible from the public internet. I'm sorry, dude. Like, you're wrong. You totally missed the point of this story, and you totally missed the point of the problem. The problem is people shouldn't write crappy, insecure code. The other problem is the QA department that hopefully exists should find the insecure code. Or... And when it goes in production, maybe someone else find a vulnerability. When they do, you should fix it. Those are all problems that you should fix before you tell people not to plug it into the internet. Uh, yes, but but you you buy it and find a vulnerability and and you report it to security at cctvvendor.com and, and it goes nobody nowhere. ever answers. Right. Because that's not a monitored site or address or it's not even a real address. So you three or, try three or four more. And then you just stop buying home security systems from Swan. Oh, wait, I said the brand name out loud. Uh, <laughs> that's a different story, but that's a personal one. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Swan. and you should yeah. probably, if you do, I mean, and some of the onus does fall on the user that if you are going to put it on the internet, you're going to do that securely, right? Now, I'm not sure where, if, you, uh, if there's things you so can do to make it not secure when you put it on the internet. Th this goes back to our, our home automation conversation of the way... We would do it, and most of our listeners would do it. Is we would segment the network and we have VPN, some access control right. lists. And you'd have to VPN in so right. that, like, you wouldn't you wouldn't give her a. Def you do what really simple thinking. stuff, like not put a default gateway on the home automation gear, so right, that it does. Right, exactly. 
so that you have to VPN in and you have to have your NAT rules set up right or, you know, so that it's harder, not impossible, but it's, it takes a lot more work to get to from the internet. But again, people that buy CCTV just want it to work. Yeah. And they're going to make it just work and expose themselves. Well, I, I was going to back out from that and just say that. Hopefully they're not exposing themselves on the CCTV. Well, well, yeah, true. Yeah, buy a, Buy better quality cameras. That's awfully grainy. No, yeah. I was going to back out on that and say just the, the average user who's going to buy a CCTV unit and is going to want to put it on the internet, it, their concept of securing it is going to be to set an appropriate username and password, and even that may not be sufficient. But they think... It only allows six characters, uh, uppercase letters, and numbers only. Right, precisely. But they think that's going to be enough to do it. And in all fairness, I'm not expecting the average user to perform a full penetration test on a unit that they bought from supposedly right. a reliable vendor. <clears throat> okay, so you no, know, we we should point that out. We, the, it's right to point that out. But on the other hand, there is a, like a different mindset. Like you and I and Paul or whomever is in the security community. By default, when we buy a device like that, we flat don't trust it. Um, and so we wouldn't put it on the right. public. Internet. I mean, it, it's uh, so talking about Nmap and scripts and and yep. Nessus or whatever your tools of choice are. You know, when you buy new toys, don't you like turn up all find all the scanners that are running in your network and just aim them at it and see if you can make it weep. Mm-hmm. You know, like my printer that Absolutely. cries help. Right. You know, I love your well, printer that cries help. It's awesome. It's, but it's. You know, you do that to, you know, some NAS that's got a four-year-old Linux kernel on it, and it completely falls over. And you're like, okay, am I going to have an argument with this dumb NAS company, or am I just going to, you know, lock it, it down? <laughs> yeah. you know, but then, like, you know, back to the point, we might lock it down and use it. But then, you know, you hopefully at work or with, you know, clients or friends or whatever, somebody says, we were thinking about doing this. It's like, dear, dear deity, no, don't purchase that stuff. Um, right. you right. can't trust the company but, and you can't trust the product. But I had this conversation with, with a customer today and, and lock it down uh, and use it means essentially we're applying some sort of different compensating control for that vulnerability that we oh, yeah. know exists Right. And uh, versus patching it because there is no patch. Right. You know, there's right. no that's, way to fix it. Uh, right. It's, it's putting WAFs in front of third-party vendor crap or... You know, right. worst case scenario, going back many, many years, back when I worked for a living and defended networks, one of the, the dealer groups I defended um, bought a whole bunch of multifunction printers, and they were just completely terrifyingly insecure. And I bought a handful of home, you know, commodity routers and put them in front of it <laughs> because uh, at least I could, you know, only I could narrow it down to, you know, LPD, LPR. It closed off Apple Talk and every other dumb thing that it was trying to listen to on the yeah, network. It was, exactly. it was a kludge. Uh, it didn't slow it down much because it was many years ago. But it's sometimes you have to do compensating controls. But again, um, the average user doesn't know to ask the question, doesn't know to test it, and trusts the vendor. And as long as the vendor gets away with it, it's, it's that. It's <clears throat> part of the problem that hardware is now outlasting software and that problem is getting worse is that we can make hardware or China makes hardware for us that lasts a really long time and so long so that no one wants to maintain software for that long and they move on to the next thing. Is that is that a compounding problem? Has that gotten worse over time? I feel like it has. I don't know if it is in the consumer and, and low end space because a yeah. lot of consumer gear doesn't last long. You're right, like your Linksys routers, you go, they just die. Right, they they just die. They overheat and die. Yeah. But if you go up market a little bit, there might be right over there a Cisco twenty nine fifty catalyst switch, which is ancient. I mean, you, you haven't been able to get software for that, no matter how much you throw it. Cisco, and it still works because we're looking. A long you know, time. it's interesting you say that, Jack. And I'm because <laughs> yes, I'm opening up myself the fact for trouble. That you can see and hear me proves yeah. that switch still works absolutely reliably. The span port between yeah. ports one and two works reliably, and thus my PVS is nice sniffing nice. this traffic. And is you know, twenty nine? Is it twenty nine fifty? Yeah, yeah. I used to. I yeah, used to that, ma- I that's used an to, old switch. I used to manage. Did you manage and maintain switch. those when you worked at the university, Joff? Oh, 
Actually, yeah. yes, I did. We must time. have worked at university at around the same time because I did too. <laughs> yeah, it was the nineties, I believe. Oh um, no, you're old, you're way older than I am. You're yeah. Well, no, it, not it as old as early, Jack, but you're older than me. Anyway, early early two thousand is when we pivoted to when we pivoted. Yeah, early two thousand when I started. Hundred yeah. megabit fiber yes. space. Yeah, that was right around two thousand. So <clears throat> we yeah. are working on launching a, a maybe well something special i can't tell you what it is i almost gave it away but i didn't but we're working on the sets here at security weekly now what's interesting is over the years i've had a lot of computer equipment recently in the past two to three years i got rid of all my computer equipment like i, I used say, to have old uh, macintosh i had those old sun Enterprise like ES four fifties, you know the like they look like a mini fridge and they're purple oh, yeah. and gray. Remember those? Oh, yeah. I had some of those. You didn't tell your wife that you've had so much computer equipment. No, <laughs> she's been around since I've had probably most of that computer equipment, and uh, I've since gotten rid of all of it. I mean, even with all the space wheel, I got rid of. In fact, like a couple cleaning, months man. ago, I did a, like a cleaning and got rid of most of it. Then we had this great idea that we were going to like move some sets around here to make room for some of the new things that we have going on, and which are all very exciting, by the way, so make sure you stay tuned. But I said, you know, it'd be really cool if we had some old computer equipment to decorate the sets with. And then I'm like, shit. Uh, I threw uh, all is, that crap Is this crap where I say out. I just got rid of some ancient computer equipment yeah. in the past few months, too? Yeah. Just That's what everyone really tells off me. To friends and, I'm like, ah, you know, Shit stain. So yeah, now we know what to what to buy Paul for his birthday. No, I, I, I but you know, here's the thing. But you don't like want to buy it. it. You don't yeah. want to buy it, right? No, it's I don't want to buy it. Basement, right? Or, I don't want to buy me, it. Underground data center. Yeah, I don't want to yeah. buy it, and I just I don't want like everyone's crap to come here to the studio. Like I only <laughs> want to like cherry pick the crap. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like I want specific memorabilia. Would somebody really had cool. a um, there was there was somebody out there that made a PDP eleven uh, in a picture frame. Uh, I'll That'd have to see awesome. if I can track that down. That'd be uh, awesome. So that, we want that would be a good one. Um, I think I I'm think. looking for more for the other set, <clears throat> more like enterprise old gear. Like it'd be really cool to have like well, oh. sun sun servers would be good because that's sun servers would be good uh yeah. i used to have um what is the blue fancy sg s just sgi sgi oh, i used SGI, to have some old yeah. sgi yeah. stuff that would look super cool Dude, uh, an, you old a next Ma- cube. an old next cube or a macintosh even would look really cool like some of that stuff would be really i used to have all of that stuff too i had two old macintoshes i sold them I was going to make a fish tank out of them. Never got around to it. So, anyway. If you have old gear, don't just ship it to the studio. Just contact us first. <laughs> we want to see what works in here. Um, so, it'd, be, it'd so, be pretty cool. So, Paul, you and I probably should go visit some of our old university friends because I bet they have some old gear. I bet they have some old gear. The problem with universities is that ancient gear may still be in production. Yeah, we have to unplug it, John. Yeah, I walk into a data center and go, you don't mind if I unplug this, do you? (laughs) And they'll be like, no. (laughs) Uh, The SGI Uh, machine I had was really cool. Was it, I S- had, I, I was had it SG? Was, what was the uh, operating system? Was Irix? It S- Irix. Was it was Irix. Irix. You're right. You're right. Yes. I, I used to run oh. Irix. And then I want to say... I want to say I replaced it with Linux. I want to try and I say I installed Linux on it. I had one of those old... Uh, I had a Sun 5 pizza box. Yeah. Remember those? Well, the, the, S- the SGI was a blue. It was bright blue. It was awesome looking. It was bright blue, and it had this gigantic monitor, which had cool colors on it. And I think that the video cable might have been even proprietary, right? It was. It was so cool. It was so cool. I don't know why I got rid of it because you just, I, you don't have enough space to store all that crap. Even in the studio here, I don't have space to store all that crap. But now I need to decorate some sets, and I want some of that crap back. Now we're just going to get random shipments of like everyone else's old computer crap. Because even though I got rid of a bunch of my old computer crap, I still have old computer crap. Well, 
if we could find you like a magnetic tape, that would be kind of cool too. I had a magnetic tape that I took, well, someone gave to me from the university, and I had it as a decoration somewhere. And I, I might have thrown it out, Joff. I might have thrown it oh, out. Oh man! Because I, I was watching, I, I was I was watching hey. Halt and Catch Fire. Uh, you ever see that show? Yeah, uh, I have not. Oh my god, dude! You so Jack. Have you ever seen that show? No. Oh my god! You guys television. totally have to watch that show. Newfangled television. No, shit. Halt and Catch Fire takes place on on like uh, technology startups in the early to mid '80s in Texas. It's friggin' awesome. It's awesome. Uh, so I'm watching that, that and they're in the data center, and they got the magnetic, uh, you know, real uh, tapes, and they're on like that holder. And the magnet. And the reason I thought of it is my magnetic thing had the holder, but you'd slide it in like the rack system. And I had one of those, and I don't know what uh, I the, did. With the it. old magnetic I tapes. I'm having flashbacks to the first yes. computer systems I yeah. supported yeah, I was mean, back when I was right. decades ago. When they had the the sort of kind of like an eight track looking yes. weird things in the in the trash compactor and and you know cube refrigerator sized mini computers yes yeah you having and flashbacks I, like, I looked you at remember my the abacus and then those <laughs> I, I was just glancing at my my favorite old computer stuff at discount prices site and had to throw up a little bit because the the section that used to be called Sun Servers. Now is called Sun Oracle Servers, uh, and that still uh, makes me twitch all uh, these years later. <laughs> yeah. uh, Snorkel. That still makes me ill, and it's been, what, seven years? Wow. We got way off topic there for a while. That's good, though. Yeah, we don't usually do that. <laughs> that's, that's an anomaly, just so you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so I just looked it up. eBay, eBay had a PDP-11, but it's like 25 grand. <laughs> oh, my God. Well, th- was, who, somebody was making the PDP-11, and it was it, the, the front of it looked right, but the whole thing was like you know a thumbnail-sized chip. It, there was no back. There was no guts to it, right? The, the whole thing ran on a single chip that was just in the control panel. I remember I that gotcha. years ago, but... It's like somebody's got Multics online. If you really need to have a flashback, you can go play Multics. Go play Multics, it might, yeah. it might just be easier and cheaper to get someone in here that's good at woodworking and just make a, make a set. But it would yeah, be cool if you can Yeah, if you can believe it, people are still preserving the software for this stuff, which is just crazy. Yeah. Man. Paul, crazy. Paul, we have a mutual friend who has a lab of ancient shit that we might want to ping. Off. Uh, I won't say his name on the show, okay. but... You and I both know somebody that we like that has just the most ridiculous stuff in his house. Larry, wow. had, Larry used to have some pretty ridiculous stuff. I don't know if he does anymore. Yeah, think, you can probably get a Vax eleven seven eighty if you want. <laughs> I would love that. That'd be so cool. I I used to have. Did I have one? I think I had one. I had one at one time, and I got rid of it. I had some really yeah. cool shit at one time. In that Dude, respect. that's 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 a big ass piece of equipment. I had some big ass pieces <laughs> that's of really equipment horrible. in my basement, too. I, I, thinking of my ancient stuff, I had an Apple Three Plus. If anybody remembers those, that was the worst thing Apple ever made. No, the Newton was the worst thing that Apple. Oh no, ever the made. Apple Three Plus was their first attempt at a business computer, and the motherboards were so unreliable that they had like a three or four hundred percent motherboard failure rate. They were literally like buying them in in the case at the local Apple shops so that they could, you know, throw one in, let it run for two or three weeks, burn up, and then run, yeah, they they were they were horrible, and it ran Apple Sauce. Remember that SOS, the Apple Server Operating System? No, I didn't even know they made that. <laughs> it had the two speed keys. The the keyboard had the two speed keys. If you pressed it one, you got one. But if you held it all the way down, it was a high speed repeat on the keys. I was. It was it was, it was it was horrible. It was worse than the, it couldn't have been worse than the Newton. I, I don't know if it was worse than a Newton, but it was mm. it was it was an epic failure. The Let's Newton just say bad. it wasn't a MacBook Pro. Yeah. Um. Wow. Just think about where we've come from. <laughs> now I <laughs> just now I need to talk about what security it, again. The, the it just doesn't seem as interesting the, as the iPhone 5s that was just announced. That's with the the most exciting four inches you'll ever hold, or whatever he said about it. What? <laughs> <laughs> phrasing 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 exactly. all right let's talk about um oh this is depressing 
TP-Link has blocked open source router firmware to comply with the FCC regulations, which the FCC regulations don't specifically tell device manufacturers, hey, don't let anyone modify the firmware. The regulations say something about, um, well, I can read it from here. Um, all devices partially completely approved under the old rules cannot be marketed as new rules and all the brands of operation. Um, yeah, TeamLink so, says so, so. the changes it's making mean that users are not able to flash the current generation of open source third party firmware. Um, this is like really bad, but there's something in the regulations that says the FCC requires here it is all manufacturers to prevent user or users from having any direct ability to change RF parameters, frequency limits, output power, country codes, etc. TP-Link says. That's how they interpret the FCC regulations. That does not, that's not the FCC saying, hey, you can't put open source firmware on there. It's saying they, <coughs> FCC, have passed regulation that they're not allowed to allow the users to modify essentially the radio is my interpretation of with Larry that, that, not that, here. That, I wish I'm, Larry was here for I'm, the story. Go ahead, Joff. No, I was about to say that's that's what I'm getting out of it. They don't want you to have the low level access to to the radio to be able to tune it to frequencies that the FCC would prefer that you don't do not travel uh, within. But th isn't this like a Pandora's box? Because you know, to be honest, uh, you know, what about scanners? What about um, uh, what about uh, uh, software defined radio? I mean, you know, this is a slippery slope. Uh, if if you're going to start talking about uh, manufacturers modifying their uh, their firmware such that uh, you cannot access frequency sets in the chips. This goes way beyond just TP-Link. I don't know. That's my, that's my two cents. Yeah, I, I think it's the easy way out. For, in, it sounds to me like it's the easy way out for TP-Link because... Yes, you're right. You you're have... Right, Jack. If, you, if you write you know, firmware at a lower level than, than the firmware you can flash on. So you, you hard code things so that you can't use, you know, frequencies out that are not approved outside, you know, inside the U S or whatever other things, but you'd have to put a lower level in that, you know, putting one, you know, DD word or open word or, or whatever you put on there couldn't override. Um, but that would cost them money. And this is a commodity consumer product. So rather than spend any more money, they're just going to, figure a way to lock you out of changing the firmware, which, um, yeah, yeah, but I how does that, how does that impact? Um, and, and maybe it doesn't, maybe this is just a TP link decision, but, but, uh, my question was, how does that impact, uh, Michael Ellsman's stuff like a hack RF one, like Uber tooth, uh, one, like, you know, these various radio projects that he has, I mean, it, uh, is FCC going to throw a bunch of lawyers this direction? Is that going to affect it? sounds like if you don't let people it's hard it's you're right it's a slippery slope but it, the fcc is saying uh, you, you can't do bad things and tp link is saying well the easiest way for us to keep that from happening is just lock you out completely um but i don't is, know how is, this, it is right yeah isn't this a little bit analogous to the encryption mm -hmm. argument i mean it's like you know we don't like you tuning to frequencies you shouldn't be tuning to Therefore, we're going to enforce that your software doesn't allow that to happen. Well, uh, it, it's really hard. You have to delineate here, Joff, because you can have open source firmware, right? But mm -hmm. the part that controls the radio or the Wi-Fi chip is sometimes open source. Sometimes it's closed source. And it's really hard to develop an open source firmware that revolves around a binary blob that lets you control the Wi-Fi access chip. So what happens is Broadcom says, yeah, here's a binary blob and it's a Wi-Fi driver and it'll work with you know, a couple of different flavors of Linux or whatever. So you center your whole operating system around that, but then you're tied to a certain kernel version. You're, you're oh, tied sure. to a bunch yeah. of different other things that then can't be upgraded. And, and that's where... Um, this particular, uh, in terms of open source, um, it, it's just a, a real uncomfortable situation. And, and open source proponents 
myself included, are up in arms about this particular behavior. So rather than like deal with that whole problem, right? I mean, because to have a full open source operating system means you have to give open source developers access to the drivers and the hardware. It means that they can control that hardware any way they like. I mean, this is a total like open source hardware and software battle at its heart. It's also yeah. like Big yeah. Brother, the government, saying, well, we don't want you, you know, uh, defying our, our regulations, which is just, it's total bull. I think it's total bull. I mean, 2.4 is an open like spectrum. Enough. You can get hardware and yeah. software that interact. I mean, you can get a microwave and interact with this spectrum. So uh, yeah, exactly. what, what is the big deal? I don't understand. It. It's, well, and, and, and the other the thing is, first, just, yeah. just to ahead. double down on what you were saying really quick, um, and then I'll let you talk, Jack, sorry, um, is... Government needs not to step in, in my opinion, needs not to step in on your ability to write firmware at the lowest possible layer to interact with the chip. That should be open to anybody, in my opinion. If you're going to lock it out such that only certain vendors have closed source abstraction layer away from the kernel vendors and that the only way you're going to interact with it is through this closed source abstraction layer, that's horseshit. I, I I double agree with you there on on that one, Paul. Because so, I, I don't, ahead, I don't think it really hurts. I was just going to relate enough and boozed up enough that we can have really shitty analogies. So uh, yes, sometimes bring on the really shitty hammers. analogies. Sometimes people use hammers to hit other people in the head, and therefore we should make hammers that can't hit people in the head. Yep, that's yeah. the very. And so we're just yeah. going to wrap your hammers in foam. Good luck driving nails with you know. That's mm -hmm. like I said, shitty analogy. But you, how far do you go to protect things? How you know you're not in forcing that look I, I get that checking every place in, in the country for somebody on the wrong channel on two four or five you know five gigahertz is is impractical but there's you're you're locking people out of things now radio waves are theoretically controlled but at the risk of sounding political if you can afford to buy your way into the FCC that's for sale to the often lowest bidder, not even highest bidder, as, you know, the current state of American politics proves, but that's a whole nother rant. That's for another podcast you're never going to start, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> politics <laughs> Weekly. Yeah, you'll never see that here. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> no, and I think you, you make it you make a good point, Jack. I mean it's it's um and I've forgotten which point you made, but it I, it's I, it was an accident if I made a good point. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> No, it's it's look. Just because you you um, take away the hammer uh, in one country, the the other the the add on I wanted to make to that is because just because you take away the the hammer in one country doesn't mean somebody else is not going to do it. It's like the clipper chip argument all over again. Don't don't do that. You know. Oh, yes. now I, I, I was now waiting for the up. I was waiting for the encryption parallel, and and that's true, right? It's like oh. That's uh, you. Can, you can't buy that here. Of course, you can get it on eBay, and you can just order it online. And yeah, I mean, think about uh, what was OpenBSD years ago, right? Oh, we can't do encryption in the states, so we're going to do it here in Canada. No problems. You know, the hey, cool, rock on. Um, so yeah, it's it's just a it's a empty argument um, because there is a lot of smart people on this planet, and <laughs> many of them live outside the United States. <laughs> surprise, surprise. <laughs> so it's interesting. There was this. Uh, Stealthy USB Trojan that hides in portable applications. So, you know, you take your USB drive and you put your portable version of Firefox on it or, or Chrome or whatever so that when you go help other people's computers, you got this little thumb drive you can plug in and run your browser. Um, it hides in those kind of applications. And this article drives me almost as nuts as the other articles we covered earlier on in the segment. And then it says, and I quote, USB ports should be disabled wherever possible, and, if that's not possible, strict policy, policies should be in place to enforce care in their use. Then goes on to say, and I quote, It's highly desirable for staff at all levels to undergo cybersecurity training, including real-life testing. Is that really the answer here? Is that... No, it's um. <laughs> that's it's if you sell that kind of training, that's the answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. It's no, it's hot glue gun in the USB slots. <laughs> Done. <laughs> uh, sorry. I mean, jo I mean, in certain environments, Joff, I think that works. In other yeah, environments, not sure. so much, man. Right? Like, 
I don't know. Look, I feel I remember this argument when it first started up when when flash media started getting big and all of a sudden the the concept of data walking out of the door physically became a really really big deal, right? We had portability of data. And I understand it. I mean, it's it's a significant concern. Uh, and now now you've got malware on USB devices, so not only do you have data walking out the door, you have bad shit walking in the door in quote unquote air-gapped environments even well, well, and how uh, a, 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 to quote to quote ed ed scotus for a minute an air-gapped environment is just a network with high latency mm-hmm. <laughs> right it's yeah true. i love that comment from ed it's a great but. it's it's very well thought out um and a great comment by ed because what are you going to do <clears throat> how are you going to get data on those systems it's either a usb drive and you fill that with glue People are going to start running network cables everywhere or enabling wireless right. devices or... Or, God forbid, going back to using, like, uh, optical media. Uh, yeah, optical media. Optical or, media. Or They're going to rip open the case Bluetooth and put a, put a card in it that, you know, maybe doesn't Bluetooth, have any yeah. external ports so no one can see. Maybe it's a Bluetooth card. Maybe it's a Wi-Fi card. People are going to find a way to have connectivity. Uh, so let's say, you fill, drive. Yeah, let's say you fill it with glue and someone you know, gets a hot air gun or something and, and melts the glue off and enables the port again. Or, like I said, just sticks another card in it after you fill it with glue that has USB ports on it. I mean, I don't know. Yeah, I think- it, well, it goes back to physical access, right? If you have physical access... Well, it's uh, all yeah. Game's over. I, I mean, won't say it's, tra- I won't say it's game know. over. You know, the FBI. The FBI would argue. I don't know, but um, if you have physical access, uh, the game uh, probably isn't going to have to go into overtime. Let's put it that way. Yeah, I think that's well said. Um, the you know, I mean, like you, we all know, if you're connected to the internet, it doesn't have to be USB, right? Your infection vector uh, from whatever malware is, you know, email, it's web, it's documents, whatever whatever you can bring into that system, right? USB is just another way to bring it in. Um, you know, so, so the, the, uh, the issue is, uh, I think it does actually, Paul, I'll, I'll, I will say the cliche, it does come back to user training and user training from the perspective of understanding that everything you reach out and communicate with, whether it's email, whether it's web, whether it's copying a file from an external media device, all of it, is a way for potential malware to get on your system. Uh, and um, I don't think as an industry we've done a very good job of being able to delineate and train about that very accurately and very correctly because it's such a nebulous concept to people. It is so far out of their day-to-day existence. All they care about is getting their spreadsheet, getting their document, whatever it is, onto their system so that they can do business. And that is such a disconnect from the low level concepts of what malware might be floating around on that USB drive or that, that pay web page or that email me- message, you know, I want to point out an article. Ooh, I see vodka and frozen glasses. I'm getting excited uh, for a martini. So, uh, I, so uh, that all, all that whole uh, thing just led straight into your segue. I'm it so did. Well, no, cause okay. Keith walked in here with a, a bottle of frozen vodka and frozen martini glasses. And I got excited. He's kind of like dogs and squirrels. Now he's got a glass from a thing. If you're going to watch anything, watch the next show because I'm going to be really drunk. Just saying. Um, Endgame has, um, and Jack and I have a a mutual friend at Endgame. You know who that is, Jack, right? We have a handful of them now, but yes. Excellent. Um, So their research team uh, produced an article. And Jack, I don't know if you've read this article or seen it. But I thought it was very well done. Our mutual friend sent it to me, and I yeah, was like, I meant to I'm going to read it I'm first. I'm glad you did. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm going to read it did, first. It was a good one. I was yeah. traveling when he sent it to me. Yeah, I'm like, I'm going to read it first, dude, and I'm going to validate it, and then I'm going to determine whether or not I'm going to tell people about it. And I tell you what, I read the whole thing, and I got sucked in, in the whole article, and I read the whole article. I'm like, that was some pretty cool friggin' research. I'm like, dude, I'm going to put that out there. And then I found it uh, in my feeds when, it, when I was going through the articles for this week. And it's really cool. It's about typo squatting, right? And it's actually, right. I misquoted right. it in, in the wiki. Which it's dot first, .om. Right. Dot .om. Right. Right. It's, which, it's typo squatting. So you first roll your eyes. Um, it's like, ah, oh, really? This? But it, they actually did like real research. Real research, yes. 
they're data scientists and shit. Um, <laughs> it's, it's pretty. You should talk to some of the some of the folks there that do the hardcore data science are, are brilliant, yeah. and it it comes out because they crunch huge data sets and like come up with pretty straightforward answers often. Yeah. Um, so I it's a it's a great article. Everyone's got to go read it. I, I I really liked it. So yeah, it was a very good article. I'm glad to hear that we both agree on that, Jack. Because um, uh, we get a lot of article submissions from listeners, which I thank you for because most of those are great. Um, we get article submissions from PR places like all the time, most of which are crap. Um, so. And sometimes we get uh, submissions just from friends of ours, right? And this one was really good. So uh, we kind of put our radar up like on high alert when someone submits us an article, but um, this, is, uh, this is the real deal. So it's pretty good. Yeah. And you know what? I want to give a shout out to a couple of people. I've had several uh, customers of mine make some really good suggestions for the show and uh, keep them coming. We do appreciate that. Uh, so it's, it's pretty awesome. We may not get to all of them, but Good suggestions are good suggestions, so nothing wrong with that. Cool. Any other stories you guys want to talk about? <clears throat> I am completely out. <laughs> there are a whole bunch of stories out there that I don't want to talk about. So mm, True. <laughs> yeah. This week was kind of a slow news week. Uh, I do. Uh, what else is in our, our security news this week? You can go to wiki.securityweekly.com, read about a new row, uh, an extension to the row hammer attack that affects DDR4 memory, an emergency Java patch that reissued, that was reissued for a 2013 vulnerability. Turns out the patch they issued, excuse me, in 2013 wasn't so safe after all. FBI warns on risk of car hacking. MITRE rolls out a new CVE system and some changes to the CVE numbers that breaks code. If you've written code around CVE, like I was like, wow, I wrote code that's totally going to break when they wrote this new CVE thing, uh, new CVE format. So make sure you do that. And uh, Netcraft has basically called people out on multiple occasions for getting web security completely wrong. So make sure you go check out those stories and more. Wiki.securityweekly.com. Yeah, yeah. That CVE stuff is just a mess. It's mine. They, they got dude. it. All I was wrong. like, "Oh my god, there's country codes in there now!" Like, oh, it's it's. it's <sighs> oh ask, man, ask really? Jer- if you want, if you want more, if you put in put a nickel in Jericho's slot if you oh want to hear god. about that one. Oh my god! <laughs> I'm gonna be hearing from my friend Steve Christie now. He's gonna be contacting us. <laughs> right, is, is this where I have to use my line, Steve? I like you. They're good people at Miter, but I have to use the line whenever Miter screws up like this. Which is, I'm so old, I remember when MITRE was relevant. Oh, oh wow. Ow. <laughs> Feel the pain. <laughs> Sorry, Send Steve. all of your hate mail to Jack at securityweekly.com. <laughs> yeah. He's heard that one before. And, and, <laughs> but yes. Um, Thanks, everyone, I, uh, for yeah. watching. It's been a fun uh, episode. Thanks to Joff and Jack and our special guest, Ferro Mavatuna from NetSparker. Uh, it's been a lot of fun. We'll see everyone next week on Security Weekly. Over and out. <laughs>